Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. As much as I play video games, you may also be aware that quite recently, I suppose, over the last few years, I've been dipping my toe into board gaming and card gaming. I've always liked card games, but when I was younger, playing collectible card games was extremely difficult. No one could afford that stuff, I tell you. Playing with old magic cards, secondhand stuff that I could find, nothing competitive, but whatever I could get my hands on. And then, of course, once I moved on to university, I got maybe a little bit more disposable income by not eating and was able to play things like the World of Warcraft trading card game, which I enjoyed quite a lot, and I'm still upset that it is gone. I'm pretty sure it was in many ways superior to Hearthstone, although online I imagine it wouldn't work quite as well. So we toyed around with that and games like The Spoils and all sorts of things, and we did used to play board games from time to time. A few times a year, my university and WoW Radio friends would get together at my place for a few days and we'll play board games like Battlestar Galactica and Chaos in the Old World and all that sort of thing. I enjoy it a great deal. For me, it's the competitive side of gaming in general, plus an added social element. But there's one thing that board games do, which video games have a lot of trouble with, and that's mostly due to how visual the medium actually is, and the fact that you have to show pretty much everything, and leaving things up to the imagination is not necessarily the way to go. And that's the idea of really weird themes. Really strange stuff that seems like it would never work in a game, and yet in board games it often does. And the reason behind that is usually because of the mechanics of the board game. Now, of course, board games and video games live and breathe and die on the basis of their mechanics. While recently there has been a rather large increase in the number of very narratively driven games that are very light on game mechanics, the vast majority of games are still mechanically driven in the most obvious and basic of ways. And for me, as a gamer, I prefer games which have competent and interesting mechanics, and I'm not so concerned about the story, because I feel video games are done best when you as the player are involved in telling that story, as opposed to having the story told to you, which is very much the case in games that hold your hand and refuse to let you control key moments and all that sort of thing. And I find that bothersome. Sure, it's a valid way of creating games, and a lot of people really like it, but I am not one of those people. And the cool thing about board games is that the board game never tells the story to you. You tell the story using the board game, and using the game mechanics, and also using the people that you're with. And that's an inherent strength of board gaming and tabletop stuff. Now, I mentioned weird themes, stuff that really wouldn't necessarily work in video games. And I think as an example of that, there is a game called Splendor. Splendor is a game about making jewelry in the Renaissance age to impress patrons and lords and noble people. That's what it is. You make jewelry. Simple as that. And that game has been nominated and won numerous awards. <laughs> it is an extremely popular game, it is very well made, and it is regarded by many people as a modern classic. Those of you not all that familiar with board games that still believe they begin and end at things like Battleship and Monopoly are perhaps missing out on a golden age of board gaming over the last few years. Board games have rapidly increased in popularity and there are a lot more of them. You can find them for almost anything. And Splendor is a great example of that. It is a game about making jewelry. Or perhaps Sushi Go, a game about making the best sushi. It is a card game which you play with others. Your aim is to score the most points by making the most sushi. There is a game about getting to the departure gate at an airport. There is a game about cooperative whitewater rafting. There are multiple games about farming, although I suppose you wouldn't be too surprised by that these days when it comes to video games either. There are games about creating electricity networks and power grids. It's in fact called Power Grid, as you might imagine. And God knows how many games there are about trains. Here's the interesting thing about board games. You can make a board game about almost anything, and as long as you have a solid set of mechanics behind it, it can still become a classic. It's not that you can't necessarily do that with video games, but I feel it's a lot more difficult. And there's a reason for that, and that's the idea of abstract thematic mechanics. And I'm pretty sure I made that up, and it sounds way, way smarter than it actually is, so let me explain what I mean by that. One of the big differences between board games and some, not all, but some video games, maybe the majority of video games, is that board games limitations can actually result in some serious creativity coming out of the designer. 
Needless to say, board games can very easily become overly complicated. In board games, you have to track all the rules, you have to track the scoring, and if you overdo it, board games can become extremely difficult to play. Needless to say, there are plenty of video games that are complicated as well, so perhaps you're saying, well, I'm not seeing the difference yet. Well, here's the thing. It's not only about the limitation in complexity, it's about the limitation in components and the limitation in what you can use to represent something happening using said components. Video games don't have that problem. If I need to represent getting shot in the head by a plasma rifle, I can show that on the screen. No problem at all. I don't need to represent something like capturing a flag because I can render a physical flag, put it on the person, and then have them capture it. I don't need to represent health with anything because, of course, I can just use a health bar, although that in itself is an abstraction. Maybe you haven't stopped to think about that all that often, but obviously a health bar is an abstraction for real damage that would be done to a person. There are very few video games that have attempted to try and properly portray real damage to a person. In most cases, it just wouldn't work. It would bog the game down in a major way. It has in certain titles, like Robinson's Requiem is a great example of an older game that really tried to do a more realistic health system. It was interesting and innovative, but it also bogged the game down in a big way. The first Deus Ex attempted to do it to some degree. Like, you could have limbs blown off or damaged, which would affect certain abilities and stats. You could have your legs blown off, which would literally make your character shorter, and you'd have to drag yourself along. But you could still do weird things like heal your legs with health kits. So even in that instance, an attempt to create a more realistic health system is still very abstract. It's very gamey, I suppose, is the best way to describe that. Because if you had a real health system, then nobody would play your game. In the vast majority of circumstances, you can't make a first-person shooter with a real health system most of the time. And you're about to tell me, well, what about the realistic ones, like armor and all sorts of things like that? Yeah, but do you respawn in those games? Exactly. A truly realistic health system would have you shot in the arm, dragged off by a medic, and spend six months recuperating in a hospital. You know, you just can't do that. You absolutely cannot. But video games have a lot more to work with, because you can code all sorts of systems and a lot of this stuff can kind of run under the hood. And every now and again they'll try and do something interesting, like say the way that Far Cry does things. It tries to visually represent the healing process by having you pull things out of your arms, bandage yourself, and all that sort of thing. But those are merely attempts to make an abstract system look a little bit less abstract than it is. It's a trick. That's all it really is. Here's the thing about board games. In the vast majority of circumstances, they don't have the ability to play that kind of trick on you because they can't show you something like that. You have to be drawn into the world through a series of plastic and cardboard components. And some of the ways that developers do that are intriguing to me. And that's really what this video is about. I don't have a huge amount of board game knowledge versus video game knowledge. I started playing maybe a few years ago and I play casually every once in a while. I think a lot of people would call me a very casual board gamer. I play casual board games like Munchkin and Dominion and all that sort of thing. I don't necessarily go in for the really heavy stuff and I really like the social aspect of board gaming as well. But every now and again, I'll come across a game that makes me think, damn, that's a really clever piece of design. And I very much admire when a game takes its theme takes its limitations and then integrates the theme into the mechanics. So the mechanics are, of course, an abstraction of what's really happening, but they're a thematic abstraction. And the game that I would like to highlight as a great example of that is one that I played recently. Some of you are probably aware that I am into wrestling. Yep, been into wrestling for quite some time. I make no apologies for it. It's hilarious. There is a board game, if you can believe it, a very recent board game by a company called Gale Force 9. For the most part, Gale Force 9 creates board games based on existing IP, existing licenses and properties, and they focus at the moment on television shows. So they made a game for Firefly, which was apparently quite good. They made a Sons of Anarchy board game, a Homeland board game. There's a Spartacus board game, which we intend to play quite soon because apparently that game is absolutely amazing. And now along comes Superstar Showdown, which has only been out for a few weeks now played a few rounds of it, and it has some really interesting ideas. Now, don't worry, if you're not into wrestling, I'll explain why these ideas are so clever. So Superstar Showdown is a combination of a card game with a grid on the board which allows for maneuvering and positioning. So it's a combination of those two things. You have to position yourself correctly because, of course, if you're halfway across the ring, chances are you can't hit your opponent. 
And you've got to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where you can be thrown out of the ring or set yourself up so that an opponent can pull off a very powerful situational move on you. Needless to say, you need to be close to your opponent to pin them and all that sort of thing. Exactly what you would expect from anything involving wrestling. But that's not really the clever bit. The reason why Superstar Showdown is really smart when it comes to its design is that it uses various mechanics to evoke the theme in a very strong way. I mentioned earlier that you can make a board game about pretty much anything, but the best board games are those that marry mechanics with theme in a way that makes sense. It's very easy to create a board game with a pasted on theme. I mean, not only do companies do this all the time, they repackage existing games with different themes to attract new audiences. I mean, Munchkin is a prime example of that. Flux is another, there's plenty more. But people on the internet re-theme games all the time for their own personal use. That's really easy to do. And it doesn't necessarily work all the time. Think about all of the versions of Monopoly that you've seen while living on this planet. I imagine you've seen quite a few, right? Pretty much anything you can imagine, whether it be local monopolies for different countries and different cities, or whether it be licensed monopolies. There are a ridiculous number of them, from James Bond Monopoly to FIFA World Cup Monopoly. There's about six of those, by the way. Adventure Time Monopoly, ACDC Monopoly, yes, the rock band. Individual sports teams have versions of Monopoly, like Aston Villa or the Atlanta Braves. There's a version of Monopoly for almost every film that was ever made, including, of course, Back to the Future. Star Wars has several, Star Trek has even more. It goes on and on and on and on, and in the vast majority of instances, the mechanics of those games are exactly the same, and they don't in any way fit with the theme. It's pasted on. Does Star Wars in any way fit with the mechanics of Monopoly? No, absolutely not. And as a result, there is dissonance between the mechanics and the theme. With Superstar Showdown, it's the exact opposite of that. The mechanics feed into the theme so very, very well. So let me give you some examples, because you're probably wondering what the hell am I banging on about here. So I mentioned that Superstar Showdown is a card game, and it would probably be very simple to take an existing card game and re-theme it to kind of work with wrestling. You could make Wrestling Magic the Gathering, easily. I mean, people keep making fake Hearthstone cards for all sorts of different games. That's easy. Creating a card game that actually feels like a wrestling match. Now, that's a different matter entirely. So, here's a few things that this game does. Now, as you're probably aware, the aim of a wrestling match is to either knock out your opponent or to pin them. One, two, three. Easy as that. How do you do that in Superstar Showdown? Well, your deck, which is preset, consists of a number of cards. And some of those cards have the word kick out on them. Now, these kick-out cards can be used to break a pin, and you kind of need to do that, because if you're pinned 1, 2, 3, you lose the match. It's as simple as that. That sounds really simple, right? That's not particularly clever. But wait. When it's combined with the other mechanics, it starts to get pretty smart. The genius of this game is that it uses your deck not only as cards that can be played in order to pull off various wrestling moves, your ability set, essentially, but it also uses it as your overall health bar. Now, to call it a health bar would be disingenuous because wrestling is not really about that, you know? Wrestling video games have done this quite a bit, but it's not necessarily a great way to represent wrestling. Wrestling is not the same as, say, a fighting game. In a fighting game, you beat somebody down until they have zero HP and that's it. Wrestling isn't really like that because wrestling is about telling a story through physical stunt work. It's a physical soap opera, for all intents and purposes. So, a traditional health bar is a poor way of representing a wrestling match. It would have been very easy for Superstar Showdown to have a little life counter that says, Okay, you start with 20 health. When you go down to zero, you get pinned, or you get KO'd. That's easy. And it's not good. It doesn't work with the theme. It's shoved in there. You know, it's a mechanic there for the mechanic's sake. It doesn't make any sense. So, the way that Superstar Showdown does it, is your deck represents your overall library of moves and also your ability to keep going in the match. Now, every time you use a card, you have the risk of losing that card. And that card goes into a stack never to be used again on your opponent's side of the board. So what the opponent is doing is they are thinning your deck out. Your deck is becoming smaller and smaller, you are losing options, and you are losing the ability to kick out. You remember when I mentioned earlier, kick out cards? 
every time you lose one of those, which you will, whenever you use one, you lose one, and you can also lose it in a variety of other ways when you take damage, the probability of kicking out goes down, because of course you have removed a finite resource from your opponent's deck. The whole point of the game is to either empty the opponent's deck completely, or lower it to such a point that they don't have any kickout cards left. Instead of tracking damage, every time you hit an opponent for a point of damage, you take a card from them. A card goes away from their deck, and it goes in a stack on your side. So they lose the ability to do certain moves, they lose options, they lose strategic choices that they can make, and they lose again the ability to kick out. And it is really, really smart because that is exactly how a wrestling match works. It is about wearing your opponent down to the point where they can't kick out anymore. A video game might do that by taking your HP to zero. This game does it by removing options and removing cards from your deck, but never throwing away the possibility that you might kick out at the last moment. The mechanic is supplemented by the one, two, three idea. So if you don't have in your hand a card that says kick out, you can draw cards from the top of your deck, which is of course face down. You can draw three cards for one, two, three. If any of those cards says kick out, you kick out and a new round begins. However, every time you do that, you lose the cards that you drew. This represents the wrestler getting more and more exhausted. This represents the notion of stamina over pure health. And that is genius to me. It is so very smart. It's such a great way of killing multiple birds with one stone. One, you completely eliminate any form of stat tracking that the game has. You don't need it. You don't need to write it down. You don't need to use 10-sided dice. You don't need to use a weird counter or spinner or anything like that to represent your health. Your health is your deck. And it's not relevant at any point as to what your HP actually is because all that matters in wrestling is either you get KO'd by losing all your cards or you get pinned. It's elegant. It ensures the game is fast paced, which is awesome. You don't get bogged down in stat tracking and wrangling over who has the most HP. Mistakes can't really be made. You still leave the possibility of an early pin and a victory because that's how wrestling works. Sometimes somebody gets pinned really quickly by surprise. They're still fresh, they could still fight, but it doesn't matter because a pin happened and that is that. It's thematic. It evokes memories, for those of us that watch wrestling, of times when that has actually happened. There are matches which are long slobber knockers where everybody is down to their last ditch effort and they throw a Hail Mary move or something like that to finish it off. It evokes memories of matches that have finished in a couple of minutes and it manages to do all that with a single deck of cards. I absolutely love that. I think it is genius. I think it is a perfect example of mechanics representing theme well, synergizing well with the theme. They're married together in a way that seemed like it was meant to be. There are other examples of things that Superstar Showdown does well, and not every game really manages to do this, and I'm going to compare and contrast this to a game called Dominion. You may have seen us playing it, I did a video of the digital version on the channel quite some time ago, and Dominion is pretty notorious for having a fairly weak theme. In that game, the mechanics come first and the themes just sort of pasted over the top of it. Is there a reason why acquiring a village gives me plus one card draw and plus two actions? Not really, no. It, but they needed a card that did that, so it's the village. Is there a reason why the council room gives me plus four cards, plus one buy, and every other player draws a card? No, there isn't. And there are plenty of examples of cards within that game that fall into the exact same trap, because they were creating a set of mechanics first and they put the theme on later. Oddly enough, every now and again you do come across a card that makes more sense than that. I mean, Dominion is maybe one of the most mainstream examples of a game where there is a huge amount of abstraction between the theme and the mechanics. The game is trying to represent you building up a kingdom with only cards. That can be quite tricky to do. But every now and again, you'll come across cards that make a great deal of sense, like the Money Lender, for instance. You gain three coins this turn, but you have to trash a copper treasure, which is a card from your deck and that goes away forever. This represents a short-term gain for a longer loss, ergo money trader. The moat's a fairly obvious one, it stops attacks, because of course you can't attack across a moat, but why does the moat give plus two cards? Because it needed to do that in order to make the card worth picking up. So that's not thematic at all. I think you're getting the idea. There's a degree of that 
in Superstar Showdown as well, because of course the signature moves of each superstar are represented within the deck. I will give you an example, one that you're probably well aware of, John Cena's deck, for instance. If I go into John Cena's deck, there are things that you maybe know of if you are even slightly familiar with wrestling. His finishing move, the attitude adjustment, for instance. His five knuckle shuffle, yes, that is a masturbation joke. No, they never ever acknowledge that. And yes, this is a superstar that's very popular with kids. I know, just wrestling's weird, okay? But outside of that, you have a fairly large bevy of moves, the sort of things that this superstar would do. So, nice theme there, you've got the photo to accompany that. But the question is, have they tied these moves into the mechanics of the game well? Or did they just use whatever? Well, let's take an example of a drop kick, A very, very simple move. Now, this is classed as a strike in the game. There's a kind of rock, paper, scissors system as to what card beats what. And then there are slams, which are big moves that beat everything and blocks that beat nothing but prevent damage. So you get the idea. Strikes beat maneuvers, maneuvers beat grapples, and grapples beat strikes. That's how it works. Each move in this game has a variety of special attributes, and you can choose to use all of them or none of them. But the attributes are thematic based around the move. A drop kick, you're probably well aware, you run at somebody, you jump in the air, and you generally kick them with full force with both your feet, and then you land on the mat probably awkwardly. That's how drop kicks, for the most part, work. You'll have seen it, even if you haven't seen it in wrestling, you've seen it in various video games. It's a popular move, and it looks pretty cool. So the drop kick does three damage, but also gives you two squares of movement. And that makes perfect sense, because most drop kicks are done while running. Obviously, because you need to get a little bit of momentum. There are standing drop kicks, of course, but most of the drop kicks you are familiar with probably involve a little bit of movement. That makes sense. There's a few others, like a diving body splash, for instance, which is done from the top rope. You need to be in the corner to do it. It stuns your opponent. Of course it does. And since it involves momentum, you also get two movement from it as well. Now think about this from the perspective of the game designer. They need to ensure that all of these decks are varied but balanced. They need to make sure that the heavy guys are doing a lot of power moves. They need to make sure that the agile guys are doing a lot of agility-based moves. But they still need to make sure that the decks are actually balanced against each other because otherwise you're going to end up in a pretty gnarly situation. So think about how difficult that must be. You've got six decks. They need to be able to square off against each other in a fairly balanced fashion. Probably not 100% balanced, I would imagine. I think if you ran the decks against each other a thousand, two thousand times, you'd probably see that some superstars have an edge over another. That's just the way that things work. It's impossible to fully balance everything, but you need to make sure that every deck is individual, but also thematic, using the moves that the superstar uses. That's difficult. That is really, really tricky. And you can see the ways that they sort of fudged it in order to make it work. There are some moves which don't necessarily make a great deal of sense. Like, for instance, why does the attitude adjustment have two movement on it? No idea. That move doesn't require any movement whatsoever. It is done standing almost all the time. But they needed to do that because otherwise perhaps this deck wouldn't have enough maneuverability in it. So they needed to kind of shove it in there where they could. And they thought, all right, well, it's a powerful move. It's got the throw attribute. It does four damage. We could shove move in there as well. Why not? That is how we're going to balance the deck. And of course, they also did it through game formats. The game can be played 1v1, but it's actually designed to be played in a series of matches using 1v1, tag teams, and six-man tag, which means that you don't necessarily have to balance one deck against another. And it's actually okay if one deck has an advantage over another because you're going to be playing a series of matches with different decks, so it starts to eliminate the variance. You know, it's a similar principle behind the way that Hearthstone tournaments work. They eliminate variance by playing more than one game because otherwise it would be ridiculous. And even what they use to try and minimize variance and balance concerns is thematic. Because of course, tag team matches and six-man tags are very common in WWE. So of course you'd make a game format based around that. Not only would it be ridiculous if they didn't, because people that buy that sort of game want to be able to do that, but it also smooths over some of the problems that the game would otherwise have. It's really smart. It's incredibly intelligent. You remember the idea of taking cards from your opponent and holding a stack that I mentioned earlier? That's called the performance stack. If you play multiple games, which you should because that's the main format of the game, 
the performance stack indicates how much momentum you have going into the next round. And momentum, again, a, a big concept when it comes to storytelling within professional wrestling, which is physical theatre. As I mentioned earlier, the story really matters perhaps more than the match does, and depending on how well you did, you can buy bonus cards using the performance stack, which means that you'll have momentum going into the next match, and you'll have a better quality deck. So there's a little bit of deck building involved in there, but it's still all tied into the theme. Everything is tied into the theme. I could go on and on and on about that game when it comes to how it ties mechanics to theme, because it's just one of the best examples that I've played in recent memory. There are plenty of others, no doubt, that do it very, very well, and those, for the most part, in my opinion, are the best board games. Some people will argue otherwise, of course, you know, chess is a timeless classic, and the theme in that is fairly abstract, let's be honest. Does it make sense that the tower or the rook in that game can move an unlimited number of squares, either horizontally or vertically? Of course not. Does it make sense that the bishop can move diagonally? No. Does it make sense that the king can barely move and yet the queen can go in all eight directions and is considered to be the most powerful piece on the board? Not necessarily, although you could also argue that there's a little bit of theme in there because of course capturing the queen, when it comes to medieval warfare, would be kind of a big deal. I have no doubt that there's some incredibly in-depth analysis when it comes to how the mechanics represent theme in chess beyond anything that I could personally comprehend, but even on a basic level you can understand the idea that it's a medieval war and therefore capturing the king ends the war, right? You know, that's how you win the battle. So even in chess, you will find those little elements of theme and it wouldn't necessarily make the game any stronger if the theme was any stronger. No, it, pr it probably would not. But I really, really appreciate it when games go out of their way to do this. And it applies to both board games and video games as well. In video games, it's more often than not far less abstract. If you want to represent pickpocketing someone, you animate the pickpocketing. It's as simple as that. If it fits in with the character, you let the character do it. If it doesn't fit in with the character, you don't implement that particular mechanic. Now, what exactly is my point? Does this have any real relevance? Is there a lesson to be learned here? Honestly, no. Now, this is pure intellectual masturbation, or should I say an intellectual five-knuckle shuffle. It's about appreciating how creative some designers can get when it comes to working with limited tools. It's about creating a strategic yet streamlined experience which is also authentic and not burdening you with extra mechanics for the sake of complexity alone. It's about elegance and pacing in design. And maybe there are a few things that video games could learn from that. I suppose the issue with designing a video game, particularly when you have a large budget and a big team, is that you have an unlimited canvas and color palette. And it can be pretty difficult when presented with so many choices and possibilities to properly realize a specific vision. We see it all the time with things like feature creep and projects going over budget, Kickstarter projects in particular. What can happen when you're given too much choice, when you are given too many means? In a world where technology continues to advance, graphics become more and more realistic, and of course game worlds get larger and larger and are filled with more and more activities, perhaps it's worth remembering just how much one licensed board game did with nothing but a deck of cards. My name has been Total Biscuit, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.